Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a Library and Labyrinth live streaming event here on Crowdcast. We are so thrilled that we have uh, over 200 people registered for tonight's event, and we're getting started right on time. And I'm going to be keeping the introductions and everything else at the beginning very brief uh, because Julian Zelizer is a very popular man today, and he has a hard stop at 7 p.m. And I want to make sure that we have as much time to hear from our two discussants, as well as lots of time for a question and answer. So in regards to question and answer, the way this works on Crowdcast is there is an ask a question button. You can put your question in that box and it can be um, upvoted by participants so we know which uh, questions are most popular. And uh, so that will be during the moderated discussion period um, that we will be doing as we can look at those questions in the ask a question function. There's also a button there so you can easily contact Labyrinth Books to order your copy of Burning Down the House. And uh, you can see earlier in the chat that there's also instructions on how to call the store if you want curbside pickup. But exciting news is they are opening to the public again tomorrow with some limited hours and some rules. So visit their website at labyrinthbooks.com to find out more about that. Um, so I think that's all. I will be quieting down the chat uh, during the talk so we can all focus. And without that, I'm gonna just get to the introductions. As I said, we want to make sure we have um, adequate time for this important conversation between two Princeton University historians. And they're gonna be discussing Julian Zelizer's new book that just got released today, uh, Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker and the Rise of the New Republican Party. And in this book, he is pinpointing the birth of the era of bitterly partisan and ruthless politics. Uh, and we are, of course, coming up to the election. So this book takes on, you know, a lot more significance uh, in this era where even in the last week or so, the divisiveness has grown. Uh, Professor Julian Zelizer is the Malcolm Stevenson Forbes Class of 1941 Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University, as well as a CNN political analyst. His most recent books are Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974, which he co-published with Kevin Cruz, or co-authored, I should say, sorry. Um, and The Fierce Urgency of Now, Lyndon Johnson, Congress, and the Battles for the Great Society. And he's being joined in discussion with uh, Professor Sean Willens, who is the George Henry Davis 1886 Professor of American History at Princeton University and the author of many books, including The Rise of American Democracy and Bob Dylan in America. He is completing his next book, No Property in Man, and it's about slavery, anti-slavery, and the Constitution. So as you can see, we have two eminently qualified historians online tonight to discuss this topic. And so with that, I'm going to uh, bring them both onto screen. One moment while I toggle them in for us. And here is Professor Willens, and here is Professor Zelitzer. And with that, I'm gonna fade into the background and let you two men take it away. Okay. Thank you. Hold on, my phone, see? Already my phone. Sorry, guys. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our show. Thank you to the uh, to Labyrinth, the Princeton Public Library. And Julian, it's great to see you. I haven't seen you in months. No. It's been terrible with this, all this business, but um, it's, it's, it's a delight to have you all here. Um, there are many of you out there, which it's really great to see that, including, and this is going to come as a surprise to Julian, including your seventh grade English teacher, Julian Ruth Ross, is in the audience. And I, you know, sort of, this is your life moment, but uh, <laughs> there you are. Um, so we're here to talk about your new book. And um, rule number one in book tours is you always hold the book up. So I'm going to hold the book up for everyone to see, Burning Down the House. Um, there are lots of ways to describe it, but you know, it, it really is a political thriller that you've written, Julian. I mean, and, and, and I must say of, of all the books of yours, and I've read every one, this is the most dramatically exciting, I think. And that's saying something because this really is a, a political thriller in many ways. You know, it's got all of the elements of a political thriller. You've got the a brash young Georgia conservative taking on the Speaker of the House of Representatives, an old school, Texas liberal, and thereby changing the course of American politics. I mean, this is a big, big deal that you've told, big, big story that you've told. It's got skullduggery. It's got backstabbing. 
it's got halfway, you know, halfway into it's got a brutal, absolutely brutal near murder, right? And a murder case that where the guy gets off. But I won't give too much away. So, so at one level, this is just a great read, and I hope that everyone will um, will get it at, just for that. You know, if we had, if we were going to the beach a lot, this would be a beach book to read your political thrillers. But it's also a book of history, and, and it answers the question that I know I get asked a lot, and you and I have talked about over the years, which is when did the Republican Party of Ronald Reagan become the Republican Party of Donald Trump? What was the turning point? When did it, the party, you know, you can say it went off the rails or it finally found its true nature, however you want to put it. When was that? Who did it? And the answer is, is Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich was the key figure in, in the transformation of the Republican Party over the last 30 years. Um, now, when I talk about that, I very often, you know, mention the, the 1994 election, the contract with America election, after which he became the Speaker of the House, and really the most, the most powerful Republican, you know, in, in, figure in the party, right? But your book takes us earlier. Your book shows us that the, 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 that the plot had been laid long, well, years before that with the, um, um, the, the, the conflict with Jim Wright. In 1989, the overthrow of a Speaker of the House, um, led by this brash young man, and there are these two figures, and what makes it so exciting, as a, as both a, a thriller but also as a work of history, are these two figures, right, of 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 Gingrich and Wright. So, let's start by just talking about them, okay? I mean, who was Newt Gingrich in 1989, and you know what what is his character like? Who who is he? Where is he coming from? Well, first, thank you. Thank you for all those kind words. And um, it's a thriller for sure, uh, in that it's a turning point in American history. And it, it also involves a, a kind of political takedown that you watch on television uh, or that you see in movies. But this is really how it happened. And I would just say um, one of the things I try to do and I wanted to do with this book before I get to Gingrich is to uh, try to start telling the history of partisanship. We, we talk about big ways in which partisanship unfolded or the party unfolded, changes in districts and how the media changed, which are all true. But I also wanted to start putting the figures in there and the moments uh, like we do with every other issue. Gingrich is He's an interesting guy. He grows up in, in difficult circumstances. His biological father left his mother while she was pregnant, uh, and he didn't really know him very well. He grows up uh, with his mom and stepdad, uh, and he's an army brat. He, he travels a lot growing up. He doesn't really live in one place. His family was from right outside Harrisburg, Pennsylvania lives in Europe, he ends up in Georgia. He gets, uh, he goes to Emory University, uh, and during that time he marries his high school mathematics teacher who he had a relationship with uh, in high school still. Um, and after that he goes to Tulane and gets a PhD in history. And he's toying with being a professor, goes to West Georgia College, but he doesn't really like the academic life. I write in the book that, you know, within a year, he wants to be the president, he applies to be the president of the university. <laughs> he wants to be the chair of the department and he, he's not very patient. So he decides to enter into politics and he had been more of a Rockefeller Republican. Uh, he liked Richard Nixon. He had been not enamored, but more affiliated with that part of the party. Uh, and, and then he runs three times. He runs in 74 and 76 against the incumbent, a Democrat named John Flint. He's an old school Democrat from that region. Seat opens up finally when Flint retires in 78 and he wins. And he wins with a pretty uh, low ball campaign uh, against a moderate Democrat uh, and a Virginia Shopper who at one point in her campaign says if she wins, her husband might stay back in the district because he worked and she didn't want him to kind of lose his business. And he unleashes an attack that she basically breaks up her family uh, for her career. And quickly you saw what he was going to do. And then he's in Congress. And, and the story I tell in the early 80s, and I'll get back to you, is in these early years, he is determined to um, reclaim control 
of the House for Republicans who had been in the wilderness since 1954. He believed the only way the Reagan revolution was ever going to happen was if Republicans took control uh, on Capitol Hill. But most important, he was willing to do just about anything uh, in that pursuit of partisan power. He didn't believe that all the old rules of politics really mattered. Uh, and from early on, he was willing to break every one of them. Okay. And, 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 and he has his, as he puts his sights on the Speaker of the House of, of Representatives, Jim Wright. Why don't you just tell us, uh, everyone, a little bit more about Jim Wright? So, yeah, so, so in the book, I mean, there's two speakers who appear in this book. The first is Tip O'Neill, who's in his final years as Gingrich is rising up. O'Neill was from Massachusetts. He was an old school Democratic machine politician who proved to be pretty popular. Uh, by 84 and 85 and, and gave Reagan a lot of trouble. Uh, Gingrich actually tries to take him down first, but is not very successful. O'Neill retires in 86, and then Jim Wright, who had been the majority leader since 76, he becomes the speaker. He's an old school Democrat. He's very much a product of the New Deal, great society period. Uh, he is a, a, a Texan, and he's to the moderate Kind of, he's in the moderate part of the party. Uh, but since becoming majority leader in 76, he had been a pretty strong partisan in terms of rounding up the votes uh, within the Democratic caucus, making sure people stayed on the same page. He could be very tough with the Republicans in terms of limiting what they were doing. But by the mid 80s, and by the time he becomes speaker, he feels he's fighting this battle against Ronald Reagan, that the House of Representatives is the last stand for American liberalism in some ways, and for a restrained foreign policy. And so when he becomes speaker, that's the Jim Wright. He's not very likable. People in uh, Washington don't personally like him. They think he's, he's tough and he's not warm. Uh, so he doesn't have personal friends. Most of his friends are back in the district. Which was going to affect the outcome of the story because the Democrats are somewhat split about right. I mean, he's not Tip O'Neill. He may, he may be a good speaker, but he's not a very nice nice person, very warm person. Okay, but let's get back to, to Gingrich for a second. So Gingrich, Gingrich is, is he's pretty cold-blooded about it, about how he's, what he's going to do. And the question was, how was he going to get right? And what he seizes upon, and in retrospect, this is almost psychedelic, he seizes upon ethics. Ethics is going to be the way that he gets at him. And there are a lot of ironies to that, right? So how, how, did, how did Gingrich go about seizing on ethics as the key to getting, to getting things done? Well, I mean, one of the interesting things I found is that even the first time he ran in 74 at the height of Watergate, he instantly picked up on, uh, or he, not picked up, he instantly promotes the argument as a central piece of his campaign, not conservative versus liberal, uh, but that he was an anti-establishment person and that the Democrats were the political establishment of Washington and that to be truly part of this 1970s period of distrust in government and changing the ways things work, Democrats were going to be the ones to be brought down. And this was a constant theme in his campaigns. Uh, in 76, when he's running against this John Flint, Flint was the chair of the ethics committee. And he argued Flint doesn't actually, you know, pursue what he's supposed to be doing. Uh, and he makes a mockery of these new ethics rules that Congress enacts after Watergate to clean up House. So uh, by the 80s, he sees this as the winning theme. Uh, and he really sees this anti-establishment populist uh, Republican argument as a way to go after the Democrats. And Wright seems like a good foil for him. Uh, Wright is never found to have violated any ethics. He doesn't break any laws. But like many legislators, he did things which for many Americans might look a little shady. And reporters were starting to breathe stories on Wright's relationships in the district. Uh, and I can talk about these book sales that Wright right. did. And so Gingrich hones in on this uh, with kind of remarkable ease and sharpness. And he uses this to whip Washington up into a scandal frenzy. 
Mm -hmm. and, and, and you've said very, a very important thing here is that you rearranged politics, not left, right, but establishment versus, you know, insurgents. And if the Republicans, who are the party of, shall we say, you know, the well-off, perhaps, um, to them to be the insurgents, that's the key, I think, to a lot of understanding a lot of Republican Party politics and their success. I mean, if you're talking about Republican populism, you don't start with Trump. You have to go back to this rearrangement in the 70s, which you've captured beautifully in the book. And, and Gingrich is the figure that does that. Okay. So ethics is going to be the way that he goes about going for it. But he picks up very early on a very important ally in his crusade against ethics, who is politically not necessarily his uh, obvious bedfellow, and that's Fred Wertheimer. And it's going to be very, very important. The, and, and really, Julie, what I'm getting at here is something that you and I would talk about in the hallways. You know, Gingrich does a lot, but he has a lot of accomplices. And some of those accomplices are people, ironically, that you would not necessarily associate with the, the, the Gingrich revolution, if we want to call it that. And one of them is, is, Fred, is Fred Wertheimer, a name perhaps that the audience is not so familiar with. But why don't you tell, tell us about how Wertheimer and his organization fit into to Gingrich's plot? Right, so uh, Wertheimer was the head of Common Cause, which is an organization that's created in 1970, and its main focus is good government reform. It really becomes a major player in Washington in the 70s, pushing issues like campaign finance reform, ethics rules, uh, good government reforms, as they're called. And Wertheimer's definitely uh, much more liberal than Gingrich and doesn't have a lot of sympathy for what Gingrich is up to. And I, I even interviewed him and he, he understood what Gingrich was doing. Gingrich wasn't committed to ethics. He was committed to weaponizing ethics. Whereas Wertheimer and Common Cause believed that these rules mattered. But what happens is, is Gingrich launches these attacks on the speaker. One of the things he does is he carries this binder around uh, with articles about Jim Wright and he'll hand them out to reporters He'll hand them out to members of Congress. He'll send them all the time. He really keeps pressure on everyone to pay attention to this. He calls Wright the most corrupt speaker in American history before there's really any evidence of anything. But uh, Wertheimer uh, and, the, and the reform community, they feel pressure because as the story intensifies, as more people start to cover Jim Wright and some of these ethical questions, it reaches a point where Common Cause has to respond. And uh, they didn't have to, but he starts to feel that way. The board starts to feel that way. And there's a key moment in my story where Common Cause says, well, there's enough there to these stories that Gingrich and others are circulating, really just Gingrich, um, that they call on the Ethics Committee to launch an investigation to see if there's anything to worry about. Uh, and that's a turning point, because when they do that, all of a sudden, Gingrich, who is seen like a McCarthyite, yeah. uh, has, he has the, the legitimation of this reform community. And Gingrich knew this, because instantly he starts talking about, look, common cause supports what I'm doing, so let's move forward. It's a Machiavellian move. It was brilliant, right? Um, yeah. I'm curious, in your, in your talks with Wertheimer, did he express any regret about what had happened, how he let his own cause be weaponized on behalf of the most partisan, you know, um, a politician of the time? I mean, does he, does he, I mean, you said he knew what was going on, but did he, looking back on it, did he have any regrets? I don't think so. I, the, the ethics committee process is a little, if you don't follow it, it's, it's odd in that the way it's set up is the ethics committee has two parts of an investigation. The first part is just to look very loosely at accusations that occur, that emerge, and to do a preliminary investigation, and then to decide if a serious investigation is needed. And mm -hmm. I think he did reach the point where there are enough questions in the press about some of the issues um, that reporters were, you know, publishing, not Gingrich, reporters were publishing mm -hmm. about right that I, I don't know. I, it, I think in my interview, he still felt comfortable with that decision, though he was very cognizant of how Gingrich used this and, yeah. and separated himself from that. Um, so I think he's kind of of both minds, which is some of the bind of reformers. Right, right, right. Okay. Well, all right. So 
he's got this legitimation from from common cause. He's not just a partisan. He is he is a, he is you know he's not Joe McCarthy. He's squeaky clean in some ways. Okay, but there's another piece of all of this um, in the in the book because yes, he's going to go after Jim Wright, and he's going to go after the Democrats. But there's also a struggle within the Republican Party in the aftermath of Reagan, right? After Reagan has left office, there's no logical um, 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 successor to Reagan in the conservative movement, maybe Jack Kemp, but that didn't last. Um, there's going to be a battle for control as of 1990, you know, I mean, Gingrich is going after the president of the United States, who's a Republican, as well as the Speaker of the House, who's a Democrat, right? So, so that struggle is going on as well in the background of all if he's going to take over the Republican Party, he's going to have to take it away from that establishment, which is the Republican establishment. Okay. Well, there's another person who's complicit in all of this, and that's you know adds to the irony, and that's Lee Atwater, mm -hmm. who's important in the story. What about all of that? I mean, here is this you know uh, figure that is George Bush's um, George H. W. Bush's campaign manager in in in, in 1988 the man who gave us, you know, um, uh, Willie Horton and all of that. Um, he, he's, a, he, he's, he's attuned with what Gingrich is talking about, isn't he? Even though he's, he's, he's George Bush's man. Oh, they're kindred spirits. I think when I went in to start this story, which I started writing about years ago, it always interested me. I still thought of it as the political maverick, political bomb thrower taking over the party. But the more I wrote about this and the more I went in the archives, the more I saw how party leaders, even though they didn't think much of Gingrich and they understood he was distasteful, they opened the doors and let him in to what they were doing. So uh, one example of that is the House Minority Leader, a guy named Bob Michael, who right. is known as civil. He's known as uh, the old fashioned get along politics. He was friends with Jim Wright. He was actually friendly with Jim Wright. Yeah, yeah. But he often, is using the same language as this intensifies as Gingrich. And he's putting out uh, party studies about why the Democratic Party is so corrupt and how it's abusive of its power. The second moment the establishment is fine uh, or complicit with Gingrich is the 88 presidential campaign. Lee Atwater, uh, who's a, a notorious political operative from South Carolina, who thinks of politics as professional wrestling uh, and, and talked about that. It's, it's a politics of theater. It's also a cutthroat politics. He likes what Gingrich is up to. And there's a moment early in the 88 campaign when Michael Dukakis, the Democratic opponent, is attacking George H.W. Bush and saying he was vice president for this incredibly sleazy, corrupt administration. And Dukakis is up by, I can't remember, 17 or 19 points in May. And so what does George H.W. Bush do with the counsel of Lee Atwater? He starts to talk about Jim Wright, and he starts to talk about the corruption of Democrats, and he picks up on the Gingrich argument and brings it to the national campaign. That's an important way in which they embrace Gingrich. And, and Atwater loves this stuff because it fits perfectly uh, what he's doing with presidential politics. So. So both of those, including that Atwater connection, which continues after my story is done, really show that the, the party establishment and the Gingrichites, they're really one by the end of the 1980s. They're one. And, and at the same time, though, you know, I think that, you know, uh, George H.W. Bush, the establishment Republicans, thought that they could, you know, ally themselves with the Gingrichites and that that was how they were going to stay in power. They were going to, you know, they would always be in control and they let these crazies help them out. And then the crazies ended up devouring them. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's an old story. Um, and another figure I was, I was really interested in, and this is something I'd stop you in the hall, the other person is, is, is Cheney, because he's around the story. He doesn't show up so much in the book, but, but, but there he is, always the, the soft-spoken, you know, the, the well-considered conservative, who had been there, you know, since Ford, you know, been there for a very long time. What role is he playing in all of this? He's a, he's a key player uh, in two ways. One is he is in some ways the cerebral voice of what Gingrich is doing. And, and he, uh, it, he produces a study actually for the, Repu the House Republicans that focuses on the corruption of the Democratic Party. And he's pushing that point all the time. He's a pretty fierce opponent of Jim Wright and agrees 
uh, and says often what Gingrich is arguing is correct and publishes this history of speakers and uh, right, that's right. That's right. Kind of points right in that direction. So, so uh, he, Cheney, is quietly a Republican who's pretty sympathetic, uh, even though he doesn't act that way, to what Gingrich is doing. And then he has this weird role in that um, he is the House Minority Whip. He becomes the House Minority Whip. But because uh, uh, President Bush's first uh, Secretary of Defense appointment, John Tower, because the confirmation is killed, uh, because of Tower's personal behavior, Bush picks Cheney to be the Secretary of Defense. And this opens up a leadership position in the House in 1989, right in the middle of the Jim Wright scandal, when Gingrich is all of a sudden being seen as this visionary. And that's the position that Gingrich will win with the support of people like Olympia Snow that moves him from being the political bomb thrower to being part of the Republican leadership. Yeah, another, you know, the ironies in this are delicious. So, well, okay, but you mentioned another name that I was on my list. Um, well, it's actually I had Nancy Johnson, but Olympia Snow is just as good. The, 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 the complicity, if you will, of Republican moderates, including people who are going to end up becoming, by the time we get to George W. Bush, you know, Republican liberals, the last, you know, Olympia Snow, the last one. What role do they play in all of this? They're very important. I mean, when, when this scandal is unfolding in 89, most Democrats still assume it will fizzle. Speaker had never been pressured into resigning in American history. This just seemed like uh, Wright would call uh, Gingrich a gadfly. And he just assumed, like Joe McCarthy, this would all go away eventually. Many Democrats agreed. Uh, but then this vote happens for who should be the House Minority Leader, which for everyone watching uh, doesn't sound like a big job, but it's actually an important job a minority whip uh, in the in the structure that leads you to be speaker eventually. And Gingrich barely wins. He wins by a narrow vote. He campaigns against this guy, Ed Madigan uh, from Illinois. And Madigan's the quintessential old school Republican. He didn't like to cause trouble. He liked to have good relationships with Democrats. Uh, but Gingrich beats him in the vote among Republicans. And crucial uh, are people like Nancy Johnson and Olympia Snow, who they also say they don't like Gingrich and they don't like what he's doing, but they said maybe he's the one who will bring us uh, the majority. Maybe he's the one who will finally bring Republicans into power on Capitol Hill and their support is crucial. I mean, uh, at the time, the fact that the two of them come out in favor of Gingrich within the Republican caucus, this moved votes and made it seem okay to accept Gingrich. It's a kind of unending story, which we still have today. Mm -hmm. I was also going to mention one last very quickly um, was the New York Times. Actually, the New York Times kind of plays a role in all of this in helping King Gingrich's legitimacy. Sure. Uh, there, I mean, in two ways. One is the scandal itself with Wright. Uh, what's important to understand is the the charges get hyped up before they're really proven. And, and that's what a lot of Wright supporters are trying to say. But like Common Cause, a lot of newspaper uh, editorial boards start to come down pretty hard on right. And uh, they start to gradually agree or accept what Gingrich is doing, even though they have other articles talking about the danger of Gingrich. And that, like common cause, to have the New York Times support what you're doing, gave this a sense of legitimacy. And they also describe Gingrich's uh, victory as uh, the minority whip, as the victory of the visionary and the bold thinker uh, rather than the hardball partisan. Uh, they present him as an alternative to Ed Madigan, someone who thinks big, someone who wants to win the majority. And they kind of, some of the story about the underside of Gingrich, which had been the story of the 80s, gets a little less play. And so that also gives him a certain amount of cover. Yeah, there's a, there's a way in which, you know, in, in effect, liberals getting manipulated or moderates getting manipulated very, very easily by this guy is a big, big part of the story. And, I, you know, and I would say that it's remained a part of the story as the people have changed. Right. Uh, all right. We, I want to get to questions in a sec, but just very, very quickly. Let's just get the denouement almost there. I don't want to no spoiler alerts here. I don't want to get everything in the way. But there is this, what should we say, um, the Democrats who stand by right, you know, they don't like him all that much, but they're standing by him. They're standing by him. They're standing by him. And then they start saying, wait a minute, no, maybe not now. And there is this, 
there's the murder story in the middle of it all that really is kind of the kicker. And without giving away any of the, 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 the juicy details, what was that about? This, this is hard to believe uh, when I even, I didn't know about it when I started the story. And at the very end, Democrats are trying, I, let me start, let me pull back by saying, I don't present Democrats as being pristine in this book. Yes, no, you don't at all. I should make right. that clear. This is not a partisan you know, story. The Democrats yeah. are kind of, you know, A, sleazy and B, disloyal, but go ahead. No, that's exactly right. And 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 one of the, the sleazy part of the story is after Democrats kept sticking to some extent with Wright and are trying to keep supporting him, this story breaks right as the House Ethics Committee is finishing the first part of its investigation. And they conclude there's enough there. Now we have to have a serious investigation. So that's going to start. And then this story breaks in the Washington Post. They won't give it all away, but one of uh, Wright's top aides, who he has worked with most of his career in Congress, uh, who has a relationship with uh, one of his daughters. Um, it, it turns out when he was younger, he was accused of a real brutal crime uh, against a woman where he almost killed her uh, in, in a random fashion. I mean, it's, it's a kind of crazy, yes. really brutal. And it comes out in the Washington Post in gory detail in the style section. Um, and that's a last straw. Many Democrats after that are like, what, what else is there? And politically, they felt that made supporting right more untenable. Right. I mean, I was going to mention Tony Coelho, too, on the sort of sleazy side, but we can we can skip it. another. I mean, Coelho is right underneath uh, right. And he also has an ethics scandal of his own. Again, where the original accusations are not proven, but one part of the story, he, he didn't act properly and he resigns. This is all happening in the same month the Ethics Committee is finishing its investigation. So Democrats are feeling very overwhelmed at this point. Still, they didn't have to abandon the speaker, which is an interesting decision in itself, uh, but that is exactly what they do. And that's what happens. And then, you know, and right falls. And it is an extraordinary event in modern political history, perhaps at the time not quite as well understood as it was, but those of us who do history, you know, I mean, this is the, the speakers, presidents didn't used to get impeached, but speakers were never overthrown like this. So this was a big deal. And, and you can really see the beginnings of the Gingrich revolution. You can see your way to 1990 and then 1994, right at that, at that point. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's a huge deal. And, in terms of the uh, uh, stability of leadership, once a speaker can be brought down this way, it, it's hard to undo that. Uh, Democrats, you know, uh, they 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 don't tell him to step down, but they make it clear privately and through their whispers to the press, they won't support him. Uh, Ed Rollins, who's heading the 1990 campaign with Atwater, they announced they're going to target right if he's still the speaker and they're going to make him the centerpiece of the midterm campaigns. So right in the end decides to resign. He's also scared because Bush's Justice Department is threatening to investigate his taxes to accelerate the whole thing. And he makes this dramatic speech where he speaks for an hour on the floor uh, of, of the House and he goes through every accusation. And he says, I'm not guilty of any of them. He says, I wasn't always the best behaved. There were moments I could have acted better, but I didn't break any laws. I didn't violate any ethics rules. And he makes this famous warning uh, where he tells both parties, stop, I will step down, you stop, and let's not allow what he says, mindless cannibalism to destroy Washington. But what he doesn't really get is Newt Gingrich has no intention of stopping. Uh, and, and as soon as this is over, he moves on to other ethics. He announces a list of other investigations he wants to launch. And even there, you see the difference with the parties. One still believing in normal and one really, you know, prepared to accelerate to 300 miles an hour. Yeah, I wanted to get to that. I mean, from now on in. I mean, as you know, our, our friend Norm Mornstein and, and Tom Mann have, have, have described the Republican Party as this outlier, became this outlier. You see that happening here. And it's not, you're very fair on both sides, but this is not a symmetrical story in terms of, you know, the, 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 the weaponization of politics and so forth. Um, okay. Um, well, maybe we should, well, let me just ask you straight out. I mean, you say this in the book, but let me, 
you know, now that I have you live, <laughs> was Wright guilty of anything that was that that warranted his resignation? I mean, was this all really in the end a a, a, a complete you know hit job on a Speaker of the House of Representatives by a um, an ambitious, hyper ambitious, and partisan um, um, figure? Um, that was completely undeserved in the end with all of the, the grayness that we're talking about. It was. I mean, Wright certainly engaged in behavior that uh, was questionable or uh, shady, uh, or sometimes his judgment was not good. But even the worst things he did, many members of the House were doing at the same time. It was not something that was that abnormal. Uh, and obviously, Gingrich himself, at the time of this investigation, he was under investigation for his own shady book deals. And yes. uh, there were stories about his own personal behavior. And so the, the idea that Wright did anything that uh, meant he had to resign as speaker, that legitimated these attacks resulting in the end of a major political career, it, it just doesn't add up. I mean, Gingrich criminalized him and, and that's just not, he wasn't guilty of any crime, and he really wasn't guilty of violating a single ethics law. He just pushed the boundaries. Um, and I found that the, I, I added this at the end of the, the book had been, uh, it was already in galleys. And for those of you uh, who haven't written a book, usually you can't change much. But I found these amazing, uh, an amazing exchange in 95 after Gingrich became speaker. And Jim Wright writes a letter uh, to Gingrich basically wishing him well and saying, I don't, I can't forgive you for kind of talking about me like a criminal and smearing my reputation. But he said, I wish you well, I want to move on. And in, in a religious way, he says, I will forgive you for what you did. And then I found the letter back. It takes Gingrich like nine months to respond. And he gives a cursory response, like, thanks for the well wishes. This is a paraphrase, new. And, um, and, and so, you know, I think Wright kind of lived the rest of his life bitterly. I, I don't think he was deserving of having his career end. Uh, and I don't think he was deserving of that. And we need to remember the accuser was doing all these things and he would ultimately be the first, Gingrich, the first speaker in American history, fine for actually uh, ethical impropriety. Yes. And I remember, I mean, it brought back that story. I, I remember very well um, all of this eight years later or 10 years later um, when I was in Washington and I was sort of hanging around the events around the, the Clinton impeachment and, and, and actually spending a fair amount of time in the White House. And I once passed by the Capitol Grill and there was Newt Gingrich and Callista, his mistress at right. the time. I mean, it was extraordinary, the brazenness of all of this and what he thought he could get away with. Um, um, and at any rate, so, so there's the story. Um, do we want to go to questions? It's just, well, let me, before we go to questions, let me ask you one last thing, Julian. We, well, then we'll have 20 minutes for questions. It seems yeah. to me be about right. Um, and then you, I know you have to go, so I don't want to keep you. Um, but, but where does it go from then? I mean, Jim Wright has fallen. You've talked about what happens to him personally and, and Gingrich's, you know, beastly behavior. But what happens, what, how do we fill in the rest of the story um, from 1989 to what should we say to, to to well even to now I suppose if you want to do it in a very condensed version I mean what 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 was set in motion and how did it play itself out um, in in American politics generally but in the Republican Party in particular Well I think um, Gingrich basically by by the time my story ends um, he was one of the Republican leaders and he had gained legitimacy not for partisanship lots of partisanship in the history of American politics, but for a kind of partisanship where partisanship is always, always prioritized over governance. And the balance that most members of both parties really had, not not all, but most, it's still considered important, it's out. And now partisanship is always considered the number one principle. And uh, in pursuing partisanship, and this was kind of the Gingrich playbook, that it was okay to do things that would erode the institutions of government. It was okay to ignore some conventional norms that had been depended on uh, to make sure decision-making could work. And it was permissible to say literally anything about your opponent. I, I quote a memo 
that his organization, GOPAC, distributes in 1990, where they're telling Republicans, if you want to speak like Newt, and they say that, uh, when you speak about Democrats, use words like sick, traitorous, radical, just beyond the pale words. And, and I think what happened is because Gingrich succeeded, because he did take down the speaker, uh, and then he becomes the head of the Republican Revolution in 94, I think you have a whole generation of Republicans bubbling up with Capitol Hill who think this is probably the best bet and you can get away with it and you should do it. And I think the Tea Party uh, election in 2010 really is kind of the second generation, the first post Gingrich generation of Republicans who come of age with this is their model. And that's what we've been having ever since. And, and Trump is a product of this era. And it's not a surprise so many congressional Republicans are pretty loyal to him. It's not just because they love him, but I think they're at some level comfortable with a lot of what he does, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Gingrich style. It's not just that they think that he is uh, their, their meal ticket. They actually think he's kind of cool. No, it, it, it's exactly right. He, everyone talked in 2016 about the Republican establishment. Where was it? What were the Bushes doing? And why couldn't the Bushes or the Romneys control him? I think Gingrich is really the establishment. He's the senior statesman. And right. if you think of it that way, 2016 makes a lot more sense and everything that followed. And I think if we talk about the pandemic and the way in which uh, you know, partisan considerations, both at the national and state level, have overwhelmed uh, in red states very basic governing demand, like urging people to wear face masks. Like public health, right. right. Yeah, it makes sense that way. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, well, should we go to questions? And I'm not sure how we're going to handle the questions. Uh, uh, read them, or is, are they going to be asked? How is that going to happen? Uh, I, 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 I just pop them up. Okay. Uh, uh, here's one. Uh, Nick How do I do that? Frequent. I'll figure it out. Now, uh, you want me to read them or do you want me to yeah, Why don't you read them? Why don't you read them? Take them, take them as you will. Okay. Jim's, Jim Wright's unlikable personality worked against him, yet it seems that Gingrich presented so well to the press and his colleagues that his personality and dark agenda were not an issue, at least not uh, at first. Yes? Your thoughts. Um, okay. And I, I, I think that's a fair argument. The press didn't love Jim Wright, and the same problems that Jim Wright had with people in Washington, uh, I think reporters didn't feel warmly to him. And um, you know, some described him as a car salesman, and uh, he had a temper. He had a real temper. I have a story uh, in my book where he throws a shoe at the head of a very well-known New Jersey uh, congressperson because he's so mad at him. Uh, and, and Gingrich, despite everything he did, I do think in some ways he seduced the press. Uh, I mean, he had this professorial image that stuck, uh, even though he had really barely been in the academy, but he presented himself as a man of ideas, even as he was being quite Nixonian in his politics. Um, and he couldn't, it was not necessarily charming, but I think he was very absorbing uh, and people would listen to what he was saying and, and somehow uh, get caught up by the grandiose arguments. I think that did matter. And I think at some level he was able to paper over uh, really what he was doing at the time. Uh, but that's not to excuse the press because it was also quite clear the McCarthyite tactics he was employing in the 1980s. Okay, now I, I, they have come up to Julian, so I'll be able to ask questions. You can cut to the end. Now we're going back a little further in, in, in history, though. Um, Nixon, who just came up, um, is he a prequel to all of this? Um, the politics of the outsider, the the you know running against the establishment, if you will, even though there was no more establishment character than Richard Nixon. But in what ways is is does this really go back before the Reagan era, all the way back to Nixon? Yeah, I mean, uh, as historians, you and I always do the prequels, and <laughs> right. nothing, even though we have our birth partying at a certain moment, th there's always elements uh, of where they came from. Gingrich actually liked Nixon when he was younger, uh, in part because he thought Nixon was trying to build a broad coalition, and he admired that uh, for the Republican Party. And he also talks with Nixon 
uh, in the early 80s uh, to seek counsel about what to do. But Nixon's very different still. And, uh, you know, Nixon still was of that generation that he worked uh, most of his life uh, in politics on Capitol Hill. I still believe with everything he did, uh, he still had some basic commitments or interest in, in kind of having a governing agenda. Gingrich didn't care about any of that. He didn't even want to be on committees. He had very little interest in the 80s in legislation. It, it was all about the slash and burn politics. That was his love. And so that's why he's different than Nixon. Um, but, but obviously, there, there's origins in the 68 campaign of the silent majority to, to some of what you hear from Newt Gingrich. Um, okay. Um, and obviously, the second thing I would say yeah. is part of the story I'm telling is, is Gingrich did understand the impact that Nixon's downfall in Watergate had on this country. And he was when he makes this pivot to really focusing on anti-establishment arguments and to figuring out how do you make the Democrats the corrupt ones, he's responding to where the country moved after Vietnam and Watergate and the shadow of Nixon. And he turns it against the Democrats. It's an incredible story. That's Democrats in the 70s, they think they're the party that's cleaning up Washington. They're the anti-Nixons. Republicans are never going to recover uh, from Watergate. But Gingrich just turns it on its head and he says, we're not the party that's the problem. It's them. They're the ones who've been in power since the 1950s. So that's another way in which there's an important Nixon-Gingrich connection. And, and here's something else that I'm going to go back to the questions, but I have a common question myself. In talking about Jim Wright, right, and all of the, the things that he did, this is normal politics that he was doing. I mean, this was nothing sleazy by any standards. It's a little on the gray area in terms of pristine politics, but, you know, this was politics, right? There's a way in which what Gingrich managed to do was to demonize politics itself. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the kind of things that we take for granted as constituent service, even, or as you know, um, the kinds of th the kinds of um, backroom deals that you have to make to get anything done. You know, I mean, there's, but there's a way in which in America, you know, hovering over the word party politics is always dirt. The word dirty, right? It's always considered dirty, right? But what 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 Gingrich did was in 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 demonizing that whole style, that whole way of doing things, he actually actually demonized politics itself in a way, so that on the left and the right these days, you know, there's this anti-political move. You have to be, you know, outside of this kind of corruption, right? And so in, in a funny way, um, you know, you can see Newt Gingrich is paving the way for, I don't want to say Bernie Sanders ideologically, but in that mood of, of anti-politics inside of both parties. Does that make sense? No, I think I think that's true. Uh, Wright would say that, or Wright's lawyer said that during the uh, ethics committee investigations. They kept warning, it didn't work, but they warned members of the ethics committee, if you kind of move along with what Gingrich is saying, all of you are going to be guilty, essentially, because he's criminalizing being a legislator. Right. And, and he's taking things that you do, like constituent work or uh, getting federal money for your district and, and presenting it as something really untoward. And um, I think that's uh, the ethos that, that does take hold. And he's, he's not solely responsible for that, but he certainly helps make politics uh, an unlikable or uh, not a criminal activity in the minds of many Americans, but, but something where the normal business of being a legislator is ugly. Uh, and that, that had a lasting effect. And, and that is, the essence of what he went after right for. Nothing unusual, nothing remarkable or exceptional, just what legislators did. And he said that isn't tolerable anymore. Right. So they ended up criminalizing government in effect. And 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 not just, you know, in the abstract, but in the way that government is actually operating. It's 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 an amazing story. And it works. I mean it works. People often ask why do Democrats not go as far? Uh, and just given what you're saying, it makes sense in that Democrats still, progressive and moderate, are a party that believes in government. And so there's always a limit in terms of how far you'll push your partisanship, because if government becomes totally dysfunctional, the Democrats have a problem, whereas Republicans, like Gingrich, they could go as far as you would, because if government is broken, if it doesn't work, if there's no decisions, 
that fits with the free market anti-government philosophy. This is why during the deficit crises, when Ted Cruz would, you know, they're going off the cliff with the deficit stuff. I mean, so what? You've destroyed the American government. This is fine. This is what we're going to, it's going to keep us in power. We're going to be, we're going to run a government that we hate. <laughs> and, uh, you know, exactly right. Exactly right. and it explains this imbalance in partisanship that people often ask, why don't both parties go just as far? Uh, I don't think Democrats can. And, and I think it's ultimately, in general, it's going to be a check, uh, you know, uh, into the future. But this, this raises the question of now, right? I mean, you know, now is a point, though, where the need for government is obvious to a lot of people. When you have hundreds of thousands, well, hundreds, 100,000 uh, going, rising, perhaps as high as 200,000 people dead because of a public health crisis. I mean, here is where I don't care how many, you know, um, unmasked people with guns are going to try to shut down the, the Michigan legislature. This is something which, is, which people can feel. You know, they need this. In, in government. And the same is going to happen when the economy, you know, opens up again, right? I mean, this is an economic disaster, unlike anything that you and I have seen in our lifetimes. So, so the question is only whether this finally might be a, 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 a break in what has been a kind of hammerlock that the Gingrichian style has had over American politics. What do you think? Maybe. I mean, I, I think uh, the argument is is accurate for sure. I mean, never have we lived through something like this, and there's no end in sight, really. Uh, no clear end in sight. This will go on for a while. And never, never in recent years have we been in a moment where government intervention is so urgent as right now. Your market forces simply aren't going to work. That said, the Republican Party uh, is... The, the, the point of the book is this is deeply in their DNA and it's going to be hard to take them out of this uh, because this is the operating mentality for much of the party. So even if Donald Trump is defeated, I, I don't think it's going to change the way Republicans approach government and partisanship. And maybe even the severity of this pandemic won't do it. And we're seeing that. I mean, a few months ago, I might have said, OK, this is going to break uh, the hold of this mentality. But look what's happening in a lot of these red states where governors are simply throwing their hands up in the air and they're not subscribing to things that might hurt them in the short term. Yeah, the only question in my mind is whether that might not change the Republican Party anytime soon. But the question is whether there's a, you know, they will be so repudiated as a result right. of what this is 1932, in other words, you know, and, and that, 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 that Donald Trump will go down as the Herbert Hoover of, of, of the Republican Party from here on. And that may not be an apt analogy, but, you know. No, no, but that is, and that's the only thing that would do it, or in 1964, where uh, one party and its style is so discredited uh, that it leads to landslide. We haven't had a landslide in a long time uh, since 84, but, but I think you're right. You know, that's the question on the table in some way. It's not only is uh, President Trump defeated or reelected, but is it, what is the overall effect on the GOP as a result of Trump's record? And, and I don't know, I, don't, I really don't know where that goes. Yeah, if landslide election, I mean, landslide in the Democrats' favor would be something extraordinary. Ah, what's going on on the screen? I can't see what's going on on the screen. I'm suddenly being, hi. <laughs> That's okay, keep going. I'm just coming on because uh, we have about uh, seven minutes until we need to make sure that Julian Zelizer is off of here. Sure. Right. So, Another question yeah. from the list, maybe? Yeah, let me... Why don't you pick your last one, Julian? Cho choose which question you'd like to answer. Okay, well, one person asked, what is the way out of partisanship? But I, I don't think we're getting out of partisanship, but, uh, but I think... Um, I think what we just talked about is the most realistic way in which you see a dramatic change. You, you need an election uh, of, of that kind of magnitude. And then I see another question. Gingrich stated that the new Republican majority will pass major reforms, restoring faith and trust of American people in the government. How often do you think that influenced Congress then? And is there any spillover uh, in the direction he took today. And then I see a Jets Giants question. Oh, I see someone. I know. Uh, well, at this point, we don't even know if there's going to be football, but uh, I, I still hope the Jets will win. 
you know, a lot, I, it was interesting. After Gingrich takes over, a lot of what he promised in the contract for America doesn't actually come into being. Um, and he certainly doesn't uh, restore faith in government. Uh, the Republicans after 94 don't uh, get much of what they promised. And, and I would argue that the path of the Republican Party since the 90s has only diminished faith in government. I mean, you, you can't keep breaking government so much and expect the public uh, to, to have great confidence in what it can do. And I think that's a counterpoint to what we're talking about. Here we're at a moment where a lot of the country, I do think, sees governments necessary. Like, people need health insurance right now. We need help for hospitals. But at the same time, for people, uh, especially younger people, they've grown up seeing government doesn't do, can't do that in terms of decisions being made. And so I think those clash. And that's a success of the Gingrich revolution to discredit government and to discredit politics, Sean, like you were saying, it, it makes it that much harder for liberal claims and democratic agendas to pass um, because you're dealing with a skeptical electorate. And I think Democrats have to work on that as well. They have to work hard to overcome years of wreckage. But in a mini way, I mean, going back to the 1932 example, right? I mean, activist government had been discredited after World War I and, you know, Woodrow Wilson and all of that. And we were going to have a return to normalcy and we returned to normalcy. And we were normal for all 10 years. And look what happened. Boom. In a compressed way, that could be sort of what we're seeing now, that that, that, that government was under Coolidge, Harding and Coolidge was thought of as, you know, nothing we, we, we respect, great skepticism about it. And it was amazing how a Great Depression brought back faith in government pretty quick. So yeah. that's, that's the, the other argument. No, it, it, it could be. And the great thing about uh, our jobs is we don't, you know, we can't tell you what's going to happen. We can only speculate. And uh, I'll end it there, too, uh, yes. in terms of uh, understanding how that could happen, but not knowing if it will. That's great. Well, I want to thank you both for being here tonight uh, to talk to us and congratulations, uh, Julian, on the publication of yet another book. And, you know, Sean, you're welcome to come back when your next book comes out. Like, I believe in holding up the book, but a yeah. delight, delight is it. Burning down the house, out today, everywhere, uh, but always support our local indie bookstore, Labyrinth, who partners with the library all the time. And uh, um, Sean, thank you for agreeing to come on and be the discussant. And, uh, Julian, thank you for taking an hour out on publication day to uh, spend some time with your hometown crowd, even if it's just virtual. Um, we miss the times that we can all be together in the library's community room, and hopefully that will be back in 2021. I'm not expecting it anytime soon, the way the numbers are going in the country these days in regard to COVID. Um, but we're glad we have virtual space to meet. This is a fascinating discussion, and um, I hope everybody out there voted in the New Jersey primary today and is out there doing their thing. So thanks so much. Okay, thank, thank you very, you. very much. Okay, bye -bye. So long, everybody. Bye bye.